So good morning, everybody. Two minutes past noon. Um, welcome to this last noon meeting of the year. Um, my name is Lucy Gilson. I'm the uh, head of the Health Policy and Systems Division, and this is a division uh, facilitated noon meeting. Uh, we're really pleased that you could join us and um, hope you will um, find the conversation stimulating, um, nurturing, um, uh, demanding, challenging and reflective. Um, so the, uh, the outline of this session is as follows. I'm just going to give you a couple of words of introduction in a minute. We're going to begin with a poetry reading. Um, and then Lance Scuti is going to provide an overview of the convening that has happened. And then there'll be some reflections and uh, takeaway learnings um, from Marsha Orgel and uh, Tracy Naledi. And thank you to them both. And time for conversation uh, around the discussions that we will um, share with you before we wrap up. So this has been a year, what a year, um, in so many ways. Um, and amongst the challenges and demands and uh, despair of the year, there have been bright spots. And for me, one of those bright spots was this convening, which was organized. I wonder if whoever's just come on could uh, close their mic. Mike, just mute, thank you. So this convening, which, um, which, which was brought together by Lance and colleagues um, and allowed a cross-Africa engagement, bringing together folks who perhaps would not normally get together and whom certainly distance would keep apart, bringing together a range of folks really to think about uh, the questions on this slide, are we, are we doing work that transforms unjust political, economic and social systems and structural arrangements, the unjust systems of the health system, but also are we doing work through the health system to transform society at large? And around that question, um, we also considered uh, from a research perspective, whose questions are we asking? What questions are we asking? Whom are we engaging with, with respect to this research, and how do we engage with them in addressing these questions? And at the very heart of this convening was the intention to draw on decolonial theory, theoretical insights and consider their relevance, their um, value, their ways of challenging and extending the body of work that is called health policy and systems research, our theory and our praxis. The convening um, not only challenged us to think differently, it challenged us to think how to organize ourselves differently uh, in the way it was um, managed and the way it engaged people um, that combined not just plenary panels and breakout groups in Google, um, but also poetry, music and yoga. And as I said at the beginning, um, the one of one of the fantastic, only one of the fantastic portions of this convenery was convening was the way it brought together an African audience, east, south, west, east, north, um, brought the African audience so together. So, so a, um, Hello, could you mute the... yourself, please, if you've just joined? Thank you. Brought together an African audience um, from all over the continent colleagues who work in this particular field of health policy and systems research, but also a wider range of scholars, artists, policy makers, all of whom um, do already or are interested in taking a decolonial approach in their work to health more generally and other social justice issues. So it was an amazing bright spot in a difficult year uh, in terms of the richness and creativity of um, this convening which happened over three days. And with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand over to Lance, um, who will uh, lead us off and share a poetry reading um, that is convenient, convening. Lance, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. And hello, everyone. Um, 
I just wanted to start by introducing kind of how the how the convening started, or at least the conception of the convening. So the Health Systems Global Africa Regional Network launched a call for convenings that explicitly calls for the decolonization of health policy and systems research as one of their central themes. Um, and we have um, written up a concept note to respond to this call, and we wanted to really reflect on um, the the idea of, or the, at least the, the 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 understanding of decoloniality in our field, but also what it requires in that researchers and practitioners located in Africa needing to build and develop collective capacities and knowledge archives that centers Africa and African people. Um, and for us, the convening really foregrounded African people as experts and provide the opportunity to highlight Africa's solutions to the challenges faced on the African continent. Um, and so what this convening really tried to do is really ground the field by making space for these conversations, um, um, uh, connecting scholars and practitioners and artists to engage in critical decolonial scholarship with the aim of envisioning socially just health systems on the continent. I will first start with a video by Philippa, um, who was um, a poet that we worked with really, and a storyteller that we worked with quite closely in designing the pedagogy and the praxis of the convening. Um, I will now uh, open the video and then play it. journey is let's get to know our continent in different ways. Another way I would like to introduce you to the continent is we are here in the middle of a pandemic. And in this time, we need to think about the people and the people who are affected by access to or lack of access to health facilities. Do you remember when the Ebola, when the Ebola crisis came to the continent? the first one in the DARC. And I kept seeing all of these reports and they were all about numbers and they were all about how many people and how many people were getting better and how many people had been, were sick and how many people were dying. And I wondered what it meant for a mother with a child looking after her child. And so I wrote this poem, Love in a Time of Ebola. And I think it's relevant now as we are in another pandemic. I heard your wail ricochet across the land the day they told you your child was gone. For days, you had wiped his sweat-drenched brow, cleaned his vomit, until at last you wrapped him on your back, walked to the hospital, the hot sun testing your strength your rhythmic movement comforting his ravaged body, your voice soothing, reminding him of his name, of who he is, of home, wrapping him in mother love. At the hospital, you found them, alien clad in masks, overalls, gloves and glasses, healers in a time of Ebola. They wrenched him from your arms. Patient number 1029, stripping him of his name. Isolate. The cold metal trolley squeakingly rolled him into a bleach cleaned room that only they could enter. Then they sprayed you clean with bleached water and locked you up for days. Quarantine. With only the clothes on your back, you sat. One question forming and unforming, forming and unforming. How will he heal without a mother's touch? How will he heal without a mother's touch? How will he heal without a mother's touch? You wanted to speak, 
but the words stuck to your throat, tears carving a valley in your chest so deep you were starting to drown. Your hands burned with a healing love that not even those tears could quench. Then one day they let you out. You asked to see your child. He is gone, Mama. May he rest in peace. You stood still for an eternity. Then you asked if you could wash and dress him one last time. If you could take him home to spend his last night in his father's house. You, you wanted to send a message home so they could start preparing his resting place. Alien clad, they opened the book and said, he was buried this morning in a special bag with the others. Then they walked you to a field not so near, pointed to a mound of soil marked by a small cross with 1029. The wire around the field held you out. That is when I heard your wail, entreating us to hold you, lest you drown in your own heart. And as each one heard, we sang out a song of mourning while our tears beat a dirge on the dusty ground below and our feet danced the earth soft. As our sister circle grew, the song traveled slow and strong through the earth. And just as you fell to the ground, it rested beneath you, holding you, softening the ground on which you lay beaten and lost. We sang and Mother Africa held you to her bosom until the pool of tears welling up within burst open, pouring into the earth and slowly, slowly you stopped drowning. You stood up, you called his name, danced his farewell and walked back home, back empty, carrying the heaviness of this emptiness in your heart. As we engage in these conversations, let us remember that we are doing it not only for ourselves, and it is not an intellectual exercise. It is an exercise for the continent. It is reclaiming our ways of knowledge. It is creating or working towards a health system that is equitable, that is accessible to all. It is reminding ourselves that we have knowledge and we are able to do the things that we need to do. Um, as we have conversations, I just want to also say and invite you to remember that all voices are welcome, that there will be difference in opinion, and that's all right. This is a short conversation, the beginning of a very long conversation, and so you don't need to say everything you need to say today. The panel speakers are called firelighters because they are just starting conversations. And so we need to remember that if we take too much time, we might be silencing other people. Share your thinking. It's not a debate, it's a dialogue. We need to understand where you're coming from. Listen with your head and with your heart. Listen to understand. Listen so the other person can hear themselves think. And remember to take the long view. And to close, I want to invoke the elders. This is a poem by Lebo Hang. This is a poem by Lebo Hang Mashile, and it says, We call on memories buried inside skeletons of the first people to walk the skin of the earth who nursed and nested in the cradle and spread civilizations across the planet like seeds. Tell us of the air that flows through the heart of the land to all life and creation. Tell us of breath, the first song. Tell us of words like constellations, of ideas mapping our contributions to humanity. Tell us of infinity, how the universe lives in us. Tell us which stars bear our names so that we no longer fear the night. Tell us of earth, of roots that course through the body of the land like veins through flesh. 
tell us of the force that squeezed red sand like dough to form mountains. Tell us how to make communities strong, like gemstones formed under extreme pressure. We call on the desert to remember when she was the bottom of the sea. Help us to understand to be fluid like water, how to be supple without losing our identity. We call on the volcanoes to inject us with flames of imagination. Once we carried tongues burping fire, we melted metals with our minds. Tell us what we have forgotten. We are not afraid of bones. Tell us what we have lost. We are not afraid of remembering. Tell us what has been erased. We are not afraid of time. Tell us who we once were. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. I'll stop the video there. Um, and I will just move to sharing the presentation. So I'm just going to, so Philippa's poem and um, the offering of working with Philippa has really helped us to craft the aims and the purpose of this convening and to really ground it in a praxis that is aligned to, to a, a non-colonial way of being and doing. And so the main aims for this um, convening was really to be a starting point for political project or process amongst health 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 systems um, and health policy scholars located in Africa to engage in catalytic yet difficult conversations and deliberations for developing language, mm. theories, tools, strategies, approaches, methodologies, and research priorities for a decolonial health policy and systems research paradigm or orientation. But it also sought to develop strategies and seek strategies for dismantling and for resisting processes and structures that reproduce and sustain inequities and injustices in, in health policy and systems, but also in the field. And it's through a process of politicizing and historicizing the field um, and, and health on the continent that we could critically reflect on whether we are doing the work that transform unjust political, economic, and social systems and structural arrangements. And so the approach to the convening was really that we together draw decolonial theoretical insights and relate this to the practices and the theories in our field in order to understand the shifts required for health systems to change and to uncover strategies for transformation of African health systems. While the conference was mainly targeted at Africans working across Africa in the HPSR field, the convening was open to scholars, practitioners, artists, performers, creatives, media policymakers, and activists who we centered as knowledge holders that we can learn from and engage and learn with and engage in a dialogue of conversation and that e all equally will have um, an agenda and reciprocal relationship in crafting strategies, priorities, and outputs from the conversation. I think that was what was very important is that we understood this convening as a starting point for an African conscientization project, one that has Africa as the locus of its enunciation. And by that mean, uh, by that we mean that we take seriously the humanity, the wealth of philosophies and knowledges, the cosmologies of the multiplicity of contexts as worthy of inquiry and as valid as well as important for our own healing, our own breathing, our own well-being and our own health. And so centering Africa as a legitimate historical unit of analysis and epistemic site from which to interpret the world while simultaneously making the equally strong argument for globalizing knowledge from Africa so as to attain ecologies of knowledge. That understanding that knowledge is an ecosystem and that Africa has a legitimate part in the sharing of an ecosystem instead of only relying on the Western Euro Eurocentric 
paradigm or epistemic um, tradition as the dominant form or the only legitimate form. Ours was a solidarity conversation, a home and a space for diverse pathways, connections and networks of opportunity. It was really to be able to understand African people, African knowledge holders and thought leaders interested in our own self-determination, intentionally transcending what the colonial transcending what the colonial project has intended. And that was for us to, to actually be in silos and be fragmented as a continent and to be able to not only re reorient our African knowledge realities and people as valuable and legitimate knowledge bearers, but also to be able to break those silos and divides mm. that exist across diverse African context. Um, and a, a part of the of the convening was a space for advocacy and social movement building. We made connections with thought leaders and pr practitioners in decoloniality on the continent to spark intergenerational and cross-border conversations, looking to black and intersectional feminist movements, um, as well as trans and queer movements um, with African health policy and systems research. Um, we wanted to engage authentically and honestly, making space for difficult conversations about power and hegemony um, in, in our particular context. And so there are particular ideas that came out of this convene that was really, that enabled a catalytic community um, and the potential for this community to really move forward into a movement for decolonial thought in health policy and system research and really be an active and proactive space in the global health community. And the first kind of sets of, of, of key conceptual insights was the intersection between the HPSR and decoloniality. And it was really understood that decoloniality presents ways to de-link from and make a break with the epistemic injustices of embedded Eurocentricism that finds expression in the idea of and the content of health policy and systems research as found in the current systems or epistemic traditions. It raises the possibility of a liberatory discourse on the intersections of power, epistemology, methodology, and ideology in the hope that new epistemic lenses will be found and applied in order to achieve a better understanding of the world realities including the realities on the periphery of the world system. It shows that the lenses embedded in the current coloniality of knowledge are in themselves technologies for the suppression of horizontal discourses, subversive thought, and a new imagination. And I think this really connects to the idea that we are struggling currently. There's an epistemic crisis in understanding the problems of the world. And so our current epistemic um, crisis, uh, our, our, our current dominant epistemic traditions are limited in how it can actually solve the world's problems. So where do we look to? Decolonial thinking offer theoretical tools with radical potential to unsettle and reconstitute standard processes of knowledge production. In this vein, the task of, of our task, at least as the conveners, was to fashion a new system of meaning making that expands on existing African knowledge systems and imagine praxis that center health as it is envisioned, perceived, and lived by Africans. And it's really a re rehumanization project. It's to be able to say, what, wh what, where do we look to, to actually um, contest, resist, and completely dismantle the systems that dehumanize African people? And it's because of this frustration with the ways in which African people are suffering and struggling in the world that our starting points is really for the love and the, the progression um, and the improvement of the material conditions of African people. That should be the starting point for how we theorize the world and how we understand our role as researchers in facilitating social change rather than only understanding um, research and knowledge purely through extractivism um, to be able to um, 
facilitate our own upward mobility in colonial institutions. So it is then important that we, the field, to recognize that the field of HPSR offers us theoriz theorizations and empirical work to guide us with engaging with social, economic, and political nature of health systems. But the field, and, and one example of that is the strong focus on social science traditions, particularly um, um, in HPSR in um, so-called global South contexts. But for, for us, it, it was important for us, for, for the potential to the field to go, to go further and to dream up that potential and to actually like name the limitations for where HPSR can go further. So we call and seek to explore the possibilities of an explicit knowledge paradigm that frames a decolonial research agenda in HPSR, drawing explicitly on decolonial theories and approaches. And we argue that anti-racist, critical race, black consciousness, queer and intersectional African feminist perspectives are imperative for advancing a decolonial agenda in the field. Some of the conversations that were quite important in, in the, or that stood out was really a focus from paradigm to praxis. And it's really to understand what are the tools that for reimagining, what are the tools for learning? I was meant to show some of the reflection points as I'm talking, um, but I just, before I go to the tools, I wanted to kind of see the scope through this graphic weave, to really see the scope of conversation um, and some of the conversation captured in this image from conversations that were had through the convening. Um, and I'm not going to focus too much and speak too much to that, but there were really, what was really important was the understanding that um, there are ecologies of knowledge and that we need to take on a, a, a cognitive justice <laughs> approach that, that, that foregrounding that as Africans, we are born into valid and legitimate knowledge systems that are capable of helping humanity to transcend the current epistemic and, and syst systemic crisis. And underscoring the fact that only once the problem of epistemic freedom has been addressed, can post-colonial states, including South Africa, achieve the political, social, and cultural, economic, and material freedoms um, as well as other freedoms that we require. So what's a what's a liberatory praxis? And so that Lance. was the, the next set of, of questions. Am I over time? Not yet, but you've got three minutes. Thank you so much, Lucy. I think with that three minutes, I'm just going to speak to some of the most more practical points that came out from the conversation. So we really drew on in as conveners framed the question of um, that Audrey Lord Sparks um, what, what are the tools to dismantle the master's house? And so this was an important question. What tools do we actually engage that doesn't re reaffirm the master's house, but rather dismantles it? Because the, the, for the master's tools will never actually dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat the master at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And so that recognition was quite important in understanding what are our genuine measures of resistance and liberation and where must it come from? Maybe it must come from somewhere else, someone completely outside of the Western canon, some maybe out completely outside of mainstream academia, outside modern political institution structures, and social processes, and perhaps outside history altogether. So what is our capacity to reimagine? And so there, 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 is, there was a conversation that epistemologically and even pedagogically in our praxis, in our teaching praxis, in our ways that we facilitate conversation, and we facilitate learning, the facilitate research, what, what does it mean for, F, for um, health systems and policy research? to learn in a, in a non-colonial way. And a non-colonial colonial way underscores that all human beings were born into this valid system and that the methodological implications when a non-colonial way of doing research is set afoot 
avoids extractive approach and anchors subject to subject relationships as opposed to um, object to subject relationships. And, and these relationships are usually shot through by the invisible white gaze of the other, the ways in which we perpetuate othering in our research. Um, and so bear in mind that methodology itself has been a tool of epistemic domination and responsible for injustice. So how do we think about methodologies? How do we think about ways of being and doing as practitioners, as scholars, but also as activists and advocates within our spaces for really building tools for counter power, tools for learning and unlearning, tools for being and becoming, and tools for dismantling, but more importantly, tools for co-building, rest restorative processes and tools for reclamation that African history can teach us together. And we need to actually dig up some of the archives for how we can move our research, our teaching and our practices forward to imagine and reimagine what it means to have socially just health systems and what it means for global and public health to be socially just. I'll end there. Thank you. Over to, and I'm going to introduce Marsha. Is that your timer, Lucy? It is. I can share these images later on with the, with, with those who attend um, afterwards. I'm now going to hand over to Marsha, who will reflect as an HPSR scholar on, on the convening and some learnings from her. Over to you, Marsha. Thanks, Lance. Thanks for that um, foregrounding. And hello, colleagues. I hope you are all well. Um, so I have a few minutes to reflect on uh, my participation in the online conference. It was over three days and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm not um, a trained decolonial scholar. And so I attended the conference with kind of a willingness to learn about how I could improve my own practice in teaching, research, et cetera, uh, from many African scholars who were on panels, et cetera, um, who have been studying this for a very long time. And there was a lot of rich content that was shared. Um, but I, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of the conference, and I'll just sort of lay the scene for that. So the premise for the conference um, was that coloniality set out to delegitimize African forms of knowledge and African ways of knowing and being. And so this conference really set out to foreground African knowledge. Um, and they did this in quite unique and wonderful ways by incorporating um, storytelling, poetry, African music, very different from one a traditional conference um, that one might attend online. So that was really wonderful. And the key lesson that I'll speak about today is that I really had an opportunity to engage with the pedagogy of decoloniality. So what it looks and feels like in practice. So I'm not going to speak about the content, but rather the way in which the space, the online conference was constructed and how that actually gave me insight into ways of doing and being and facilitating that embraces um, decoloniality. Next slide, Lance. Lance, next slide. Are you able? Are you not able to see me changing the slides? I can see it now. Thank you. It's okay. there. Thank you. So, one of my what I'm going to reflect on is this issue. Every day before a, a panel, there was a storytelling or a poetry um, of some form that was uh, African that told the story of something. Uh, from Africa. So, for example, you would have heard um, the the poem of Ebola that sort of started off uh, this engagement today. So, some of my some of my learning is actually just remembering that storytelling is a legitimate African knowledge source. And my personal reflection is that, you know, art is not only entertainment. And so I was reminded of the multiple forms of African knowledge that is lost perhaps in my own work. And I sort of reflected on why do I not make 
more time to actually listen to stories, to engage more deeply um, across um, these forms. Um, and I also started to ask myself, so I don't have obviously all the answers to these questions, but I'm sort of sharing my reflection. So has my mind been colonized in my own work? So the rich storytelling that took place over the time really made me reflect on who do I understand to be an expert in Africa? Um, I'm sorry, whoever's just joined, could you mute? Thank you. Sorry, Marsha. Thanks, Lucy. So it made me reflect on who do I understand to be an expert in Africa or on Africa? And who do I understand as uh, what do I understand as professional ways of doing and being? And I'll just speak uh, one minute to this. I was, I guess, reminded about when engaging with the poetry, when engaging with the music, uh, why don't I, what is my world, world view on who holds the knowledge in Africa? And so I was questioned, uh, I was, I reflected on that. And then what do I understand as professional ways of doing and being? In this particular conference, we were really encouraged to create a sense of community. There was a lot of chatting going on in the chat box. Um, the facilitators were constantly reminding us to engage with each other, and there were forms and ways in which we could do that. Um, there was breathing exercises. There was yoga, which I will speak to next. And I wondered, what is it about or ways of doing things that really made me feel lots of joy? And why is it that in other spaces that are much more considered to be professional, where one shouldn't laugh, one has uh, two minutes, there's an official hierarchy in a space. And what what is the disconnect there between ideas of ways of doing things in the world when we engage in academic spaces? Next slide, Lance. Marsha, one minute. Thanks, Lucy. OK, and then my final slide is basically um, so in the convening as well, there would be breaks where there would be a yoga class. Well, five minutes of yoga. And this reminded me again of how dancing and movement with your body is a rich site of knowledge and memory in Africa. And I felt really reinvigorated after doing the yoga. So my final two points and. What I can say from engaging in this decolonial practice, it reminded me that the way we understand learning is beyond just our mind. We also bring our bodies into the space um, and that we are complete human beings, not just minds, um, bringing our whole selves into processes. And then finally, what does it mean when we think about our body in relation to teaching and research and what can we do with that information and what more do we need to learn to actually embrace that in our own practices? So my final comment is that it was a really rich experience. It was different. Uh, it was such a visual and um, yeah, it was really great and really different um, in ways of doing. So thank you, Lucy. Thanks so much, Marsha. And then Tracy, invite your reflections. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and good afternoon to, to everybody. Um, I think uh, a lot of, of my reflections have been touched on uh, by, by my colleagues. And also, like Masha, I also attended it just to broaden my own understanding and my own um, knowledge. And I think the first take home for me was this understanding that when we are talking about um, decolonizing the health system design and, and delivery, we're actually talking about structural determinants that are more than just race. They include gender, sexuality, and all those things, and how all of these actually intersect with um, how we deliver health services and the ethics um, and the power dynamics um, thereof. Um, and I think what I mean by that is that what is very clear, and I think certainly this is where I've, I've believed before that, you know, the design of, uh, of health system is, is, is something that is, um, 
you know, uh, almost objective and it's there's a way in which it's done. You know, we've got WHO building blocks and and you do all of that. But what is implicit that actually has I've become very much more aware of it is that, you know, that design of health system has its own unconscious biases that exclude people and 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 that does not accept people for who they are. And when uh, and 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 actually, you know, we we pride ourselves, for example, in this in South Africa and the Western Cape, that our health system reaches 80 percent of people. But the question is, do we reach those people on their terms? Do we validate who they are, or do they literally have to strip themselves of who they are and their culture to be able to access health services and to access care? And I think that speaks to some of the issues that Masha has just been talking about around identity. I mean, it was so wonderful to be in that space and be able to and be surrounded by black scholars who actually were taking the lead, not only in designing the symposium, but 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 also leading it. And I think for me, we were really living this notion that we are what we've been waiting for and no one's coming to save us and we need to, to save ourselves. And for me, the, the conversation what really centered this whole notion and it was spoken about it and it's also in the report, this whole notion of, of Ubuntu, you know, recognizing people's humanity. And I think the comments that I won't repeat that Masha has just been reflecting on around um, how that made people really feel included. And, and also in the way we introduced ourselves. I mean, I think when we all, I mean, when, when I introduced myself, I introduced myself with the whole concept of Saubona, which actually means that I see you. I mean, a, a, a not just I see you just in your physical form, but I see your humanity. And, and actually, and understanding that those things are not nice to have, those things are quite essential and critical and essential to health system de design and delivery. And the issues of, of knowledge that um, that, um, that 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 Lance and 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 Lucy and, and Mesha actually also touched on, um, you know, that it's a recognition that uh, the the knowledge within health takes a particular lens of Western biomedical um, systems. And really, I think as we as um, here as our teachers and scholars, the question is: Do we are we able to broaden our knowledge and our reading and our understanding to include some of those other kind of social science analytical theories um, that, that Lance wa was talking about. And really, it starts to understand these unconscious biases that are brought on by our own practices as, as health practitioners. Um, so, for example, are we able to hold the fact that our patient can believe both in Western biomedical practices and cultural ones, and that there's no contradiction in that, and that both of them are complementary and they are not contradictory, and both of them are essential for that patient. Are we able to hold those systems? And I think as UCT, um, are we able to broaden our own framework for learning and teaching, as Marsha and, and Lance were talking about, in terms of broadening it, in terms of the, the students that, you know, even broadening the conversations and the conversations with whom our students have them with. And so when we actually um, are analyzing, are designing, or even monitoring and evaluating the things that we do, who decides that a particular intervention has been impactful and in what way? You know, UCT, for example, prides itself for UCT, the faculty. We proud ourselves of being, you know, the first African university to do this, the top 50 in the world to do this, the X number of publications we are the best in this and we are the best in that and we really pride ourselves in all those criteria but really when we start thinking about uh, decoloniality we really need to ask ourselves is that is, is that really um the only criteria for success if that success has been born in a context that has not been inclusive can we truly celebrate and really be excited and wonderful and about that access that success or do we need to really ask ourselves to say surely there needs to be much more and i think with covid in particular it's really asking us to question ourselves into the things that 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 we value you know so as a university um 
you know, we live in a country where there is so much in, in, in inequality, inequity. Can we really feel that we are a success in that context? How do we measure success? How do we measure whether or not we have been impactful? So, you know, um, the fact that our students pass, has that been impactful? Have we been impactful in, in the health system, in the communities that we serve? Um, so as an institution, is our, is our success locked in in the success of the well-being of those we serve? And I think for me, me, I just have really more questions and things to reflect on and to really think. And I think most of us are feeling also a little bit uneasy about these concepts. And I, and I know certainly when I listen to these, I find myself having to Google a lot of terms, having to understand a lot of things. It's all very new and it's very, and, and I think for me, I've come at it with um, kind of the feeling that I'm here to learn. I always almost feel like many of us have lots of things that we need to unlearn and learn different things, different ways of being. Because even though we're talking about decoloniality, what became very clear is that even us as ourselves as African, we've been stripped of our own knowledge system and our own understanding of who we are. And I think there is also a call that all of us, you know, we all need to, to we, we, we just need to relearn and learn new things. So uh, for me, I think as, a, as, as an academic institution, that's a question for us is that what exactly is, are we teaching? What are we, are we learning also? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm sorry to um, interrupt there, but you did ask me to. <laughs> um, so just want to uh, thank you uh, all three for, for the inputs. And we do have a little bit of time, a bit less than we'd hoped for, but we've had a very rich set of reflections. Um, and so I want to open it up for questions, comments, reflections. Um, we did have a couple of questions to, to pose back to you. Um, let's see if they... Um, prompt any thought, but um, also just open to your reflections. Please, um, please chip in, comment, question, ideas. Can I just check, can you see my questions? Yes, Lucy. Thanks, Marsha. I very much um, appreciated the, the, the way in which um, Lance presented the, um, the range of ideas and perspectives and uh, uh, approaches that were discussed, and then the way in which Marsha and Tracy uh, provided their own commentary on what they took away from this discussion. And, uh, you know, in a way, it is about how we engage in the world. Um, I suppose as educators, how we um, we we think about our education um, as an institution, how we um, understand our place in the world, um, and how we um, understand the health system and the, the the way the health system is structured. Those are some of the things that I took away from the reflections from from Marsha and Tracy, um, and we 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 spoke about it being relevant to health policy and systems. But um, I, our questions here are, are saying, you know, it isn't just about health policy and systems, it's about all of us um, and, uh, and has relevance to all of us um, in wherever we are in this institution. Um, these are difficult um, discussions and for some of us, um, new concepts and new theories. And so I also appreciate the, the way that, uh, Tracy, uh, you spoke about um, leaving with questions and needing to to go out and think more and and look up uh, some of the terms and so on. And others uh, in the room may have um, other experiences, wider experiences you'd like to share. So please, please feel free uh, and please feel free to say, I didn't quite understand that. Um, we can only discuss these issues if we um, if we're willing to uh, put all our ideas on the table. And that's certainly what we would hope. Um, Please, I invite uh, inputs, thoughts, reflections. Lucy Feroza has got a hand up. Thank you so much. I couldn't see that. Feroza, welcome. <laughs> 
Hi, hi, thank you. Um, and thanks to all the speakers. I think this has just been a fantastic report back of a conference and we need to have more of this um, of, of these types of conversations um, and also just reporting back from other conferences to to a wider audience to see what the um, local and global discussions are. But I'm looking at your first question and I think it is it is so important. This is essentially the starting point. Um, I think for many of us, um, and I definitely speak from 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 my own perspective here. We we come into jobs, we come into positions, we come into careers with a default way of thinking. It's how we were taught, how we were trained, um, and we just kind of move along with those trains of thoughts and and we get on with it um, without questioning what our assumptions are, without questioning where did our knowledge come from that we've that we've acquired. Um, and while I think that how we are training our health science students now um, does take a bit more of this into consideration, but I think for a large number of us when we were trained back in the day, I'm not going to reveal my age, <laughs> um, that actually wasn't the case. So, so I think that first question is absolutely pertinent. Um, how do we recognize coloniality? And I don't have the answers to that, but I think it's about now shifting our lens and trying to foreground that lens in terms of how we see what we teach, what we practice, um, how we manage ourselves, how we manage our colleagues. Um, it's it's an all encompassing um, manner of being, I think, understanding what our assumptions are with regards to coloniality and then implementing that in terms of our work and our training. Thanks, that's my reflection on this. Thank you so much for Rosa. Thanks so much for that uh, that reflection and that input. Um, would others like to share responses? And, and it may those responses may be I haven't quite understood it, and that uh, or I haven't it doesn't have meaning for me. I, I don't uh, I can't connect to it. Um, or it might be I'm thinking this for pedagogy. Any other thoughts? So Lance, let me um, pose a question back to you, if I may. Um, and the question, yes, is, thank you. The question is, where is the, where are the discussions of the convening going? Um, what's the next step um, in relation <clears throat> so to the next? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. The next steps are that we have a website, um, and the website is on Lucy's um, shared screen, www.africanhealthfutures.co.za. And that basically is an our attempt of cre curating and creating an archive for different outputs from these different processes. So we have the we had the convening, we also had an organized session um, with at the Health Systems Global. Um, that informed some of um, that was informed by some of the conversations at the health systems global Africa regional convening. So we have different pro diverse processes. We're also building connections um, with other departments. So the decolonial feminist hub of psychologies, as well as colleagues at UWC, the Chesai Collective. Um, as well as Decano, um, Tracy is the is the chair, the board chair of the Decano um, the Decano Fellowship as part of the Atlantic Institute, and I'm a Decano Fellow. So we have a number of different partnerships that we are trying to coordinate, and there is a lot of capacity. It is an open space um, to build really collectives in decolonial thinking, and it is a space for learning, for reflections, but coming with a with with a strong um, agenda of conscientization, advocacy, research, as well as art and, act and activism, um, poetry, storytelling. So really creating a space for health um, and, 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 and for, for people working in the areas of health to come together to think collectively about a decolonial agenda for health. Um, we don't know yet. I mean, locating it at UCT is probably what we are not trying to do. So we are imagining and reimagining how and maybe it is right now that it's a virtual space because it's a space that doesn't carry a lot of institutional memory um, in in the sense that the colonial memory is not carried forward but we are exploring options for a hub or a space to really ground our work um, 
and and really to to get us all as South Africans to reflect on South African people at least, and even those working in in South Africa, but might might be might be from other countries, to really come together to explore um, what, how do we do decoloniality. I think that's that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. We're trying to f- understand a paradigm and what that paradigm can help us to facilitate conversations about praxis um, and right. about uh, approaches. Yeah, sorry, that's it. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Lance. I just want to then throw to Marsha and to Tracy, if I may, the question of um, for yourselves, you know, how will you do things differently? So Marsha, you're a researcher, you're an educator, you work in the health policy and systems field. Um, how will you try to take forward the convening reflection? And Tracy, you're in the deanery. You are a, a leader in this faculty, um, yourself an educator, a health systems person. Uh, uh, how will you take it forward? So Marsha first. Thanks, Lucy. Um, interesting question. And I guess as a researcher or an educator, all of these systems that we contribute to, we have to start with ourselves. And so I guess for me, it's about reflecting on in which ways am I being perhaps um, uh, colonialist or um, I guess subjugating others perhaps. And so stepping back and thinking about in my research, am I actively creating spaces of equality? What are the tools to do that? What am I going to do uh, in a classroom setting to ensure that students uh, feel empowered rather than subject to me and my supposed authority or knowledge? Um, so it's really, I guess, a process of beginning and doing that. And in meetings that I set up or that I write an agenda for, what am I doing to actually actively engage um, the humanity of others in that space rather than just seeing it as another output? And I Great. guess one. OK, yes, I'll stop there. Thanks. Lucy. I apologize. I apologize. Um, no. exercising power, perhaps. But um, I'm just looking at the time. And. Yes. Um, Tracy, I was going to throw it to you, but I see Karen's got a hand up. Um, so maybe you can have 30 seconds each. Karen, would you like to pop in and then I'll give Tracy the last word. Thanks very much. So thanks. Uh, that's been a great, uh, it was a conference that I had or a, a session that I really wanted to attend, but, but was unable to. So I'm delighted to have had the benefit of the reflection. Um, and I think that this is certainly what we are grappling with as we are wanting to shift the curriculums um, on, on, on undergraduate space. And I think um, part of it is around um, how we teach, who teaches, uh, the, the, and what we teach, um, and rethinking and re-examining our, our assumptions around that. Uh, but also around creating safe spaces. Um, and Marsha just, just prompted me on that, that one of the concepts that we have is to create spaces for storytelling um, and sharing of experiences so that um, we are able to, to disassemble the stereotypes that are manifest in a single story. Um, and so creating physical and, and, um, and time spaces for both faculty members as well as students to be hearing that. So that's certainly part of what's on my agenda. So um, I'd, I'd be you. delighted to have some input, uh, Lance and anybody else. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. Great. And Tracy, we uh, we are at one o'clock, but um, it would be great to have your thoughts. Thank you. So, so I, I think for me, we're coming into the faculty at a, at a great time where the Transformation and Equity Committee, for example, um, has already developed and, and launched the, the transformation framework that gives some of the things that Karen is, is talking about. It's already kind of institutionalized in the seven pillars that are in Chapter 4. I'll encourage anybody who hasn't looked at the faculty transformation framework to have a look at it because it starts talking about these three issues of power, um, of, of, of knowledge systems and identity, and how how we can transform our institutional culture to to kind of start talking to some of these issues that we're talking about today. So I think as a faculty, we are on that journey uh, and I think it's still early days, but uh, looking forward to being part of it. Thanks, Lucy.
Thanks so much, Tracy. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, uh, thank you especially to Lance for convening the convening and for convening this noon meeting, but of course also to Tracy and Marsha for their contributions. Um, this is the last noon meeting of the year, so it is our um, opportunity to, to wish you all um, some peace, some reflection, some times of joy in the weeks ahead and to thank you all for your continuing contributions to the work of the school, to the work of the faculty, and more importantly, to our society. So thank you so much and see you in the new year. All good wishes and goodbye. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye.